Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. Welcome to our series that we're doing on Hot Talk, Passionate Debate for a New Age. As you know, through this rather long series, we have subtopics under that. And last week, we had a conservative columnist from the Boston Globe, Jeff Jacoby, uh, expressing the view that after 9-11, that the public's right to know or government's right to know extends further into privacy than before that. Today's guest will argue from the position that privacy is more extensive than our guest last week and that you have more protection or should have in relation to privacy. We're very pleased to welcome to the program Jack Van Valkenburg. He is the American Civil Liberties Union uh, Executive Director in the state of Idaho, and he's had that position since 1990, as well as the Legislative Council for the ACLU of Idaho. He often writes and speaks about this subject and a number of other civil liberties questions. From 1988 to 1990, our guest was the Assistant City Attorney or the Prosecutor for the City of Boise. Uh, he has served for a number of years. Uh, on the Ada County uh, Human Rights Task Force, and he served as uh, on the executive committee of that organization. Our guest holds a baccalaureate degree from the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington, and he has a doctorate in jurisprudence from Northeastern University School of Law in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, Jack, welcome to the program. I've known you for years, and you're very articulate, and we're so pleased you could be part of this series. Uh, both on campus and on this program. Well, it's great to be here, Tony. It's great to see you again. It's great to be in Northern Idaho again. Thank you so much. And we have our regular panelists, uh, and we welcome them, is Janelle Burke, an attorney in Idaho. And next to her is Erna Reinhardt, who is the director of public relations at North Idaho College. And Janelle will ask the first question <laughs> today. Jack, welcome to the program. It's nice to have you here. Thank you. I, my first question will have to do with where do we find privacy in our lives? What, from what source do we get this idea that we have a certain amount of privacy that's guaranteed to us, perhaps by the Constitution, mm -hmm. when in fact there aren't specific mentions of that kind of thing in the Constitution or the Bill that's of Rights. Right. So where, where do we get these ideas? Yes, the word privacy is nowhere in the U.S. Uh, or the Idaho Constitution. Um, but the courts have interpreted there to be a right of privacy that is inviolate. Um, it actually stems from more the Fourth Amendment than any other place in the uh, Bill of Rights in the Constitution. Um, the Fourth Amendment reads that the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects as against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized. So as you see, the right to privacy protects, to the extent there is a right of privacy, we are protecting against unreasonable searches and seizures of persons, houses, papers, and effects. Um, at the time the uh, Bill of Rights was uh, established in, what, 1791, um, uh, that the the home was very was was very much as it still is but i would say even more so it was the place for privacy it was where you had not only you you had all of your papers you had your your medical or your financial things um and now today that realm is no longer just in the home it's in it's on computer servers and the like so perhaps the courts need to be looking to protect privacy more than just protecting the home. Um, and of course it's been extended to such things yeah. as automobiles and, right. and other kinds of things that weren't around at all at the time of the Bill of Rights. That's right, that's right. But they do have that special concern about the home even more than they care about the automobiles and places that uh, one, one might visit. Um, of course there are other places in the law that uh, privacy comes into play. There are some uh, consumer protection laws or uh, uh, privacy protection laws, but they aren't um, strong. There's the Privacy Act um, in, uh, that Congress passed, but it protects theoretically against um, uh, government in, 
accumulating information about you if you don't have cause, if, you, if there isn't cause to believe that you um, should be the subject of an investigation. Well, now the government um, can buy that information or can access it by getting uh, companies to give it to them. So the government does have a lot more private information than they've ever had before. Welcome to the show, Jack. It's Thank great you. to have you here. You just touched on this a little bit, but I thought maybe you could expand on this concept that now in the 20th century, the 21st century, we have corporations and businesses whose mission it is to store data and then in some cases even sell that data. So how has technology affected our rights as individuals to privacy? Well, I, I mentioned uh, today uh, the concept of bigger brother, big brother, weaker chains. Um, or, no, I, I guess it was um, the, the monster, big monster, growing monster, weaker chains, because the technology has caused essentially the creation of a monster. Not that technology is bad, but we have to know what it is doing and what impact it has on our privacy. And we might want it and have some chains have some restraints, such as they have in Europe and other, uh, other industrialized nations. Um, there are stronger laws that protect against private information being uh, accessed um, without your knowledge, without your notification. Sometimes it's wrong. Sometimes criminals get it, as is Checkpoint and uh, the uh, LexisNexis scandal have indicated. So um, it's created quite a monster. And I think our society is slow in coming up with laws to handle that monster. Um, I think uh, we need to recognize that, as I mentioned, our medical information is not just in our homes now. It's on computer servers, and we need to be able to decide consciously whether or not we want it available to everybody or whether we don't. And let's make some reasoned judgments on that. The word privacy is not in the Constitution, that's the word, as we know, but the court has recognized it in the Fourth Amendment, and in several cases, the <coughs> Ninth Amendment, mm -hmm. and, and I, I would say the one that I find most interesting is Griswold versus Connecticut in the Ninth mm -hmm. Amendment. They made it rather clear that privacy is there, uh, that very, about contraceptives in Connecticut couldn't be sold and all, and when they talked about the sacred precincts of the bedroom, I just think that pow mm -hmm. is powerful, and then by application, the Fourteenth. I sound like a lawyer, which I'm not. But uh, in relation to you, who are as an attorney, uh, are you confident that the court will continue uh, to move down that road, or, or will uh, will there be erosion in some ways uh, in future court decisions about um, how f extensive is privacy in the U.S. Constitution? Yeah, that's a good question, and I really think it probably depends on the context of what what the issue is before the court. Um, you know, Griswold gets into uh, your private uh, sexual behavior and whether or not uh, the government can be involved in mandating or not allowing um, uh, certain kinds of things to happen, such as contraceptives to be uh, there. It was in Connecticut simply being um, uh, bought by married couples. Uh, the law denied it, but uh, the court saw that this was ridiculous, and they found this right of privacy as as being uh, implicit in the Bill of Rights, essentially. Um, you know, and we have expanded in certain directions in that way. But the, uh, the you know sodomy now is behavior that is privately protected um, uh, between even two men, so that. Now the court has gone to the point where they recognize that uh, uh, private sexual behavior is not the government's business. Well, I think that's fantastic, and it's long overdue. And, you know, maybe someday the courts will um, advance to the point where, um, well, I think they've already would strike down Idaho's fornication law, if they ever had it, you know, in Idaho, to, mar to unmarried people, no matter how old you are, um, but if you're not married, you can't have sex, and that's against the law. And there were some juveniles, some youth, I should say, in Twin Falls prosecuted on that just last year. So 
those things need to be fixed. And I think the court is moving in that direction. Now, with respect to um, waking up to the fact that this is a new world with the um, with a, a surveillance industrial complex is what I might call it. Um, I think they're going to be they're going to be slow. It took a long time for the court to recognize that wiretapping was an invasion of privacy. Um, they, for a while, were just looking at whether or not it physically was an in intrusive into a private space. Um, finally, they now recognize that you need to have a search warrant if you're going to invade somebody's private telephone conversation, you need to have a search warrant. Well, maybe we'll move towards that, but it's going to be decades, I think, where the court reflects, in great part, the sentiment of society, because the courts don't go too far out in front of society, and I think the people this year and over the next decade are going to be waking up to the fact of how much information is lost uh, in terms of not, they're not even controlling whether or not it's uh, maintained as private. In addition to the court, Congress has a role to play. I have been really interested recently in the case, by the time this airs, there'll be some time passed because we're doing this in March, but Choice Point in Atlanta yeah. that gathers a tremendous amount of data on, on many, many people uh, sold some of that data to what they thought was a small business and they turned out to be a criminal group or criminal gang. And then I saw that they were brought before <laughs> the Banking Committee of the U.S. Senate, and they really got raped over the coals by the senators, understandably so. Yeah. And it seemed that the senators on both sides of the aisle were very disappointed in the like of, of apparently the concern this organization had. So in the future, will in the near future, will mm -hmm. Congress step in with some of the things you're talking about in Canada and in Europe where there's more yeah. clear regulation of protecting privacy? Yeah, I think it should happen. I think it will happen because I think um, these revelations in just the past month between uh, Choice Point and LexisNexis and Bank of America, all of these records uh, that are no longer as private as we thought, uh, getting out and getting accessed and some of them getting wrong, um, wrongly uh, identified, um, really will shake Congress people and hopefully will cause some people to uh, to get some legislation passed. It probably would be, it, it probably will increase when some members of Congress have their ID, ID yeah. uh, identification stolen. Right. Or, um, that always brings tension to it when, you, when, you, when you're personally <laughs> affected. That, isn't that the truth? Yeah. <laughs> Janelle Burke. Although it's difficult to generalize, Idahoans seem to be a rather rugged individual type mm -hmm. society. Idaho in general is um, more, and, and in the Inner Mountain West, our viewer friends who are mm -hmm. from throughout this area, rather rugged individuals. What kinds of things can you tell them that they can do, some just pointers, to safeguarding their privacy? Good point. Um, yeah, I do believe that we are well, we should be a live and let live state, and to a certain extent, um, um, uh, our our policies and governmental actions reflect that. Um, what things can people do to protect their privacy? I mean, just you need to be aware that whenever you use your cell phone, or whenever you use the internet, or whenever you uh, use your credit card, that information is not necessarily just going to the recipient. That information could well be sold and it could well turn come back at least as junk mail to your door. Um, and I would encourage people to not only th be aware of that, but to the extent they're not willing to pursue that. You know, um, banks have privacy policies. When you will get your bank statement, often you'll see it and you could exercise some of those rights, which is not to allow certain information to, to be um, transmitted. Um, or, uh, yeah, that, I would, um, it's a tough, it's a tough thing, because all, otherwise all I can say is, you know, we need to talk to our legislators, we need to write letters to the editor, we need to advocate, we need to, you know, support forums like this where we learn about it. But, um, you know, it's just a, it, without crawling back and becoming a hermit in the hills of Idaho, uh, how do you protect your privacy is a very difficult thing, you know. Cash 
instead of checks, cash instead of credit cards. You know, you can play that game, but it's tough in this modern world. And probably some critical thinking throughout the whole thing as to what yeah. what is important and what's not important, and how are we yeah. how are we sacrificing individual freedoms? Is that right. something you would say? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I I think you know because we don't have the constitutional or protections. Um, we really need to be talking to our Congress people and telling them that we want protections. We want uh, to uh, look at some of the other countries in the world that are industrialized and find out how it is that they're working and protecting privacy better than the United States. Or right That segues right into my question. Yeah. Um, you spoke with us a little bit this morning at the forum about Canada, uh -huh. and many of our viewers are, are in Canada. So yeah. can you share with us, Jack, what some of the differences are that the Canadian government have put in place for their people where their um, privacy laws are a little bit different than in the United well, States? Well, you know, I wish I had uh, somebody from Canada here mm -hmm. to explain it because I don't know much. I do know that Canada has, as I understand it, a commissioner, as many European uh, countries do, a commissioner of privacy. And that commissioner, as I understand it, can be a part of meetings about government and maybe private industries' um, interest in invading private information of the people. Um, I think that's terribly important, and I think that that commissioner ought to have the power to put a stop to it or at least put a hold on it until there is more review. But I don't know that power exists in, in the Canadian Privacy Commissioner. I, I believe that Canada has protections such as some of the European countries do uh, with respect to um, notification where, uh, as to what information they have Ha they have that has been uh, disseminated, um, correction of that information because so often you will be you 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 will be identified incorrectly. Um, but I don't I can't tell you more details. But I think maybe we can get a Canadian person <laughs> on the show. Great, great idea. <laughs> <laughs> we lo love our Canadian <laughs> friends. Uh, when you deal with rights, in the Bill of Rights, in particular, if someone. Um, Prints something, or not prints it, but actually writes it, and it's censored. And then a court rules that it's released, and it's it's a delay, but but it will get to the public. Or if there's mm -hmm. been an attempt to deny a certain speech, and it's a rule that it can be against the public. My point is this: Is there any other right in the Constitution when the laws cannot be regained? That is, if one's privacy is lost, even though in mm -hmm. court there might be some compensation, uh, you can't restore it. So does that make that right? more necessary to be guarded than any others because it's gone forever if the privacy is Oh, gone. you're a lawyer, Tony. <laughs> I think that's a great argument. I hadn't considered, and it certainly intuitively makes sense to me, that that ought to be considered by courts and by Congress uh, as they consider privacy laws. But um, I don't know um, that there is much, you know, you can't, you, there, there are a few things that you can um, not undo, but uh, exposing your privacy. Um, if you have a secret, if you have information that you isn't necessarily dangerous to anybody, but you don't care to share it. So, some people some are very out, private, you know, and it's out forever then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. The question is with regard to emails. Mm -hmm. Indeed, you probably have done some work in the email area or something mm -hmm. similar to that. Can you give people some advice as to email privacy? Oh, boy. Most companies, I suppose, have some kind of a, an email, um, some kind of a, a governing rules for email within the company. Yeah. But, but what happens? Is email out there forever? Yeah, when you email, it is pretty much out there forever. Um, and there is a, a library of, in San Francisco of, I believe it includes emails. It definitely includes all material that's on any website. I know this because of the prosecution of Sami Al Hussein and uh, one of the, uh, uh, that was the student uh, from University of Idaho who was charged with terrorism and, and eventually acquitted, but it was a, it was a sad day that the Justice Department brought that uh, Muslim gentleman 
uh, before court because they didn't have any evidence that he had done anything wrong. Um, at any rate, they th accused him of uh, violating um, terrorism laws because he uh, was involved in websites. Um, he's, he's Muslim and he's a computer expert and he um, worked with nonprofit organizations who had websites and one of them, just as uh, uh, you can see free speech messages all over, w one of them had um, a fatwa that promoted um, suicide flights uh, into buildings and so they thought he should be held responsible for that even though he didn't write it. Yeah, right. um, anyway, that came out in the course of, um, of the trial. Uh, that tells me that you know not only are, are uh, websites uh, stored, but he, all of that is accessible. Whether or not it's stored in one location or whether it's, um, uh, or whether it's simply accessible. Um, yeah, everything that you do on a computer beware um, it can be brought before you every 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 website and one of the things they did with Sami al Hussein was point out that he had on his website pictures of the of the of the 911 tragedy and then another computer person pointed out well my goodness everybody has that who has looked at the news because if you've seen the news that is permanently stored on your computer I mean you can access it through that computer so it's 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 tough and in terms of tips, Boy, you know, I don't know. I'm still dealing with trying to get some spam software so I can <laughs> clean up my computer. I'm tired of being offered low interest rates or, or talking to desperate housewives. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> but beware, because the government can use the information. The government can retrieve and can use that information if they so desire. Yeah, I, I just have to say that TV show, Desperate Housewives, is <laughs> getting high ratings. <laughs> <laughs> Erna Reinhardt. Jack, 9-11 changed a lot of things, and especially the role of, the law, of law enforcement in general. They are now um, under that pressure of trying to prevent terrorist attacks rather than to investigate crimes. Yes, so yes. could you comment a little bit on it? I know this morning yeah. you had a great comment on um, the, the role of government and, and Big Brother versus community policing and I thought right. maybe you could take a few minutes to talk about that. Okay, I'd be happy to because yeah, I think there are in a sense two two approaches that law enforcement can take and I'm not saying they need to choose totally between one or the other, but I think they've focused too much on data collection treating everybody in the world, particularly in this country because it's our country. As, as suspicious. Uh, anybody who's in the country, we want to protect our country, so let's treat everybody as suspicious, and until they're proven innocent, uh, and even if they are, we're going to continue to gather their data about it, because you, once you're innocent today, you might be guilty tomorrow. So, so that's one approach, is to uh, 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 build the haystack of information, looking for that needle who is the terrorist. The other approach is the traditional proven approach doesn't always work, but it has let our democracy live and allowed our between our our prosecutors and our criminal justice system and our court system, we have a relatively safe country, and we could use that same system to prosecute terrorists. Um, what that means is not only gathering evidence and um, and using search warrants when when you have cause to believe there's evidence to be found, um, but it means um, being a good neighbor and not doing what too much the government has been doing of targeting and sus but making suspects not only of everybody but particularly of the immigrant population who might be our greatest ally in terms of preventing another 9-11 because if they would not be alienated against us, if we did not round them up and by the hundreds and then deport them even though we never charged them with any terrorism crime and if we had not prosecuted Sami al Hussein in this country and if we had not uh, uh, you know raided the, the, the essentially had the FBI raid the mosque in Boise um, if we would be more sensitive uh, to the immigrant population, as well as just more respectful of everybody's rights, I think we would um, be able to get some more information. 
Mm -hmm. um, and that's what you really need is voluntary information when somebody hears, but people are scared to tell the government information because maybe they're going to come after them because guess what? Yeah, my visa isn't exactly appropriate, or I don't know, maybe it is appropriate, maybe it is right, but the last person I knew who went to the government just got deported, so why should I go to the government? I'd rather just keep my nose clean and mm -hmm. let a terrorist incident occur. So. I, um, I think that's got to be much more the focus. We're almost out of time, but on federalism, something that's very fascinating in all the states that any rights that you have under the U.S. Constitution, state constitution, state law must obey that. Mm -hmm. But also, some states go further than the U.S. Constitution, therefore you can give more mm -hmm. rights than right. less. The Montana Constitution has a section in the Bill of Rights that just spells out privacy. So in some states, do you have right. more privacy than others? Oh, absolutely. And it's wonderful that some states like Montana's has a constitutional right of privacy, and I hope that Idaho would establish that. Um, we do in Idaho, through our courts, recognize that you can, there can be certain areas, certain things that, um, that the U.S. government, mm, uh, through the U.S. Supreme Court Constitution and, the, and their interpretation of the U.S. Constitution, might allow government uh, invasion of privacy that, in fact, under our state constitution, we don't. But it's, it's not much different. And finally on that, uh, if a state constitution is very expansive, in fact, there was yeah. a famous case before the U.S. Supreme Court from Washington State University in which they lost mm -hmm. there, but they won in the state of Washington in the state Supreme Court. So a state Supreme Court has the power right. to extend that protection if it's in their constitution. Right. So we could, in fact, have a privacy clause that would really protect our privacy, including our private data as well as our, our privacy from government invasion if we would only have a, a stronger state constitution. So in answering Janelle's question, one of the recommendations could be to strengthen one state's constitution. I think that's a good answer, yes. <laughs> I'm not supposed to give answers, I'm supposed to ask the questions. I was <laughs> sharing that with you as a, as a possibility. <laughs> that's a great, great solution. Uh, it's so fun having you on the program, and we've had a great series, which will continue next week with other guests, but it's been very, very uh, informative this uh, symposium we've been having. And good luck in your work and thank you for being with us. You've been okay. generous with your time. Thank you, Tony. Thank, and thank you the all. panel for their outstanding questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we will continue uh, this discussion, which has a couple of more weeks to go, uh, dealing with uh, hot talk, passionate debate uh, for new age. We hope that you're enjoying uh, these very, very, uh, uh, what we believe inspiring and energetic topics uh, for you. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. Music